need to praise him down here, but there will come a day. Amen. The Bible says every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. There will come that day here on earth. I will tell you that. They were singing that song there about when I lay my Isaac down. It brought my mind to a story that I heard uh, this week. Because so many times we feel like we have to go and give God something in life in order for God to love us and God protect us and, and uh, God to save us. And the story was told this week and it was back in the slavery days and and said that the master went out one day, and it's a true story from what I understand, uh, the master went out one day, and the uh, slave was out there, and he was in the ditch, and he was had a, a sling blade, and he was just cutting grass, but he was just singing an old-fashioned hymn, amen, just singing to the glory of, of God. And the master came up riding on his big white stallion and looked down in the ditch and said, how can you be singing like that with what you're going through? And you're just out here in the hot sun, he said, uh, down in that ditch, and they said uh, the slave looked at him and said, it ain't about what's in that ditch, it's about what's in here, amen? amen? And said he told him, he said, how can I get that? He said, listen, you see that hog pen right over there, just on the other side of that fence? He said, yeah. He said, go and crawl over that fence, go waddle in the mud for a little while, and then look up to God and ask him to save you. And he said, I'll go to hell before I do that. Said so the slave looked at him and said, help yourself. So the next day, the master came out there on that same white stallion, and the slave was down in the ditch, and he said he was singing again. He said, I don't understand it. How can you sing like that? How can you shout uh, like that and hot and sweating in the ditch? And he said, I done told you it ain't what's down in the ditch. It's what's in here. He said, I'd really like to have that. He said, that's not a problem. Go crawl over that fence. Go get in the mud, waddle in the mud. And then you'll look up to a holy God and ask him to save you. He said, the master said, no, I'll die and go to hell before I do that. He said, suit yourself. He said, the next day the slave went out there and he got out there in the ditch and was sling blading. He said, he heard something, heard, looked over there and seen a horse tied to the post over there and looked and said his master was over there climbing over the fence to get to the hog pen. He said, he looked at him and said, master, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, I want to get in that mud so I can call on God. He said, Master, you don't have to get in the mud. He already knows you will now. Come on and get it right. Amen. Listen, God knows whether we will or not. Amen. Look, we don't have to go get in the mud to get saved. I will tell you that. But I can tell you this. God does want us to lay down that thing that we're putting before God. Amen. God wants us to lay it down so that we can have freedom in Christ to worship Him and love Him first and foremost above everything but I dare say most people sitting in this auditorium today has an Isaac somewhere in their life that's more important to God that's more important than God and God said just lay it down amen listen let's all do what we've been doing around here on Sunday morning while the choir is coming down and uh, let's come get around the altar and pray for a little while and then we'll get some things done here at the church house this morning father we love you and God we thank you for this day thank you for your goodness God, I waddled in a pig pen long enough in my life. But God, I thank you for the day that you convicted my wretched soul. And God, you saved me. I thank you for that. I thank you for sending your only begotten Son to die for me that I might have life and have life eternal. I thank you, Lord, for the promise of heaven, the promise of a mansion, the promise of the streets of gold. But more than anything, I thank you that I don't have to die and go to a devil's hell. I thank you, Lord, that you've spared me from that, Lord, through the shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And God, not only for me, but you did it for every person sitting in this place today, every man, woman, boy, girl, every child that's ever been born. I'm thankful that you died for us all. And so, Father, today I pray, God, that we would worship you and, God, we would magnify you. Lord, in our lives, with our voice today, with our actions today, everything that we say and do, every song that's sung today, God, would you help us, Lord, to glorify our holy God. God, I know there's many prayer requests going out around this altar this morning. And, Father, you know the heart, the name, the need of every person, Lord, that's uh, going out to today. I pray, God, that thy will would be done in those families. God, in the hearts of men and women, Lord, today, kids that are crying out, Today, Father, I pray, God, you'd meet that need. And, Father, may you will be in the center of their life. God, I pray for this church and other churches of like faith, God, that, uh, Lord, we had searched the book today and 
God, we find the answers that we need, Lord, to be able to live life down here and to occupy until you come. And Lord, that, that simply means to be busy about the Father's business. Now, God, we got a generation that's busy, but most of the time it's not about your business. It's about everybody else's business. And so, Father, would you help us today and glorify yourself through us. Bless the singing. Bless the preaching today. I pray, God, for power and unction of the Holy Ghost. Lord, in a way today that I'd preach so simple a little child, Lord, could understand, but God, it would confuse the devil today. Uh, God, and Lord, Lord, you'd have to, uh, Lord, just pull the blinders down over his eyes today before he pulls it over ours. And God, I just pray you will be done. Lord, we love you. We thank you for salvation. Thank you, Lord, for loving us before the foundation of the world. And Lord, today, forgive us where we fail you and fall so short in so many ways. We ask all these things in Christ's wonderful name. And all God's children said, Amen. Well, it is good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. If you're visiting with us today, I want you to know you are our honored guest. We appreciate you being here. I appreciate the good choir this morning. Thank God for them and the song that they sing here uh, at the church. And you just continue to pray for them. By the way, choir practice today at 4.30. 4.30 today we have choir practice here uh, at the church. For you choir members, don't forget that. If you want to be a part of the choir, see Miss Jane sometime today. And she'll tell you what you need to do. Uh, for that, listen, we, we need a few more in there. I will tell you that. But listen, we just want people going to sing for the glory of God. Amen. There's enough people in this world want to be seen. We want some that don't want to be seen. That don't want to be seen. They'll just sing. Amen. And sing for the glory of God. But if you want to come today, uh, we'd love to have you. We see her. Uh, and then several things going on over the next, especially this month, next month. Don't forget the Vacation Bible School coming up on the 21st through the 25th. Uh, and invite kids to come. And uh, they got a good program laid out for that, and they're still working on it. And then also the Arise Conference coming up with our youth, July the 19th through the 23rd. Pray much for us there. Pray for Brother CT and all the staff that will be there uh, working toward that. We look for a great time for these kids uh, while we are gone. And listen, I want your, I want your children to have some God and I time this, this summer. Uh, not their time, but God and I time. And I pray they'll get along with God even before they go. And beg God to touch their hearts while they're there and give them something special they can come home with that maybe they didn't have uh, before. Nothing else, that zeal. I pray God to rekindle the zeal uh, in their heart to serve Him. So you pray much about that. And then don't forget, next week, not this week, but next week we are going to be going to the tent meeting up in Kernersville, Brother CT. We'll be going either Monday or Tuesday night, and I know we're going back on Friday night with the youth. And so don't forget that, and to come and be with us there. We're going to take the bus, the van, or whatever we need to uh, take, but don't miss a blessing of being there uh, if you can. And let me say this, uh, tonight uh, for the 6 o'clock meeting, I, I'll see how much time we got as far as preaching. It all depends on what God does, but we're going to, during that 6 o'clock meeting tonight for a few minutes, we're going to have a meeting for the ark trip, for going to the ark in September. Uh, Jane's been, talk, been talking with some tour uh, folks and, and got some prices and so if you think that you are interested in going to the ark in September, okay, uh, with the church group, be here tonight, and we're going to give you the prices and what it costs uh, per person to go and the dates we'll be going and who will be there uh, singing and those kind of things. We do have some outside folks from the church uh, that want to go with us. You know, if the bus is not full, I will uh, tell you that. And so we told them, we, of course, it all for the church first, but I think we may have some room uh, for them to go but that will be tonight during the meeting and we'll you know if we have time then no doubt I'll be here preaching tonight too and so you pray much about that if you would okay any other announcements today well you're a good looking crowd this morning amen I normally say with a few exceptions but I'm not going there and my wife says there's people sitting out there wondering who you're talking about I said they ain't wondering Amen. Hallelujah. We love you today. Amen. Come on, Michael. Let's take an offering this morning. All right. We've got our ushers to come this morning. And while they come and be turned to page 393, we will sing When We All Get to Heaven. And I, I told Brother Cliff earlier, he asked me what we were singing this morning. I told him, I said, and it's phoned off of our Sunday school class this morning. Amen. We had an outstanding Sunday school, and I ain't going to take much time. We had an outstanding Sunday school class this morning. Yes. And we got to talking about it and just discussing. Brother Chris didn't even get to teach much. 
And we got talking about discussing just about heaven and about God's grace and how Amen. good he's been to us. Amen. And about how their names are written down there yep. in the book of life from the beginning. Yep. From the conception, our names are written down in the book of life. And it's our choice whether or not we choose to That's accept right. that gift or That's not. Right. And I thought about it earlier. I thought this song has run through my mind. And me and the kids have sang this song I don't know how many times this week. When we all get to heaven, Amen. what a time that will be. Amen. What a rejoicing that will be. The thing is, I want to see everybody there. Right. I don't want nobody to be left out. But the sad part is, as they mentioned this morning in Sunday school, that it says that hell hath enlarged herself yeah. daily. Yeah. It says nothing about heaven, but it says hell hath enlarged yeah. herself daily. Amen. But what a rejoicing it would be to be able to see everybody here today. Amen. Together in heaven one day. Yes. Yes. I, 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 it's been on my heart, been on my mind since then. We're going to sing this song. But I want us to sing it with rejoicing this morning. Amen. I want us to sing it with excitement this morning. Because if we're going to heaven, one thing for sure, we ought to be excited about yeah. it. That ought to be one of the most exciting things that we do today Amen. is be excited about what God yeah. done for us, Amen. for saving us from where we come yeah. from. Yeah. Amen. Let's go to the Lord and pray this morning. Bless our heart before we get started. Brother Brian, will you pray for us? Yes. Amen. Let's all stand. 393.
not excited about it. If I was you, I'd just get my heart right with God so I could be excited about it. Amen? Listen, because we're going one or the other. Amen? We ain't got time to go there this morning, but we are. I will tell you that. Uh, Miss Kelly, Tillian, you going to sing for us today? All right, you, you come on up, her and Blake. You graduates that are in here this morning, uh, while they're getting this song ready, if you want to go back and get your cap and gown on uh, and be ready as soon as they're done with this song, I'll march you in. We've got, some, got something for the graduates this morning. Amen.
child of God. Remember me. I appreciate that, and uh, boy, appreciate the song this morning. We've got several, uh, actually, we've got four uh, graduates here today that we're going to recognize. Just a minute, Elliot had to go in the building, I think, but they're just fixing to come in, and so we want to recognize them today. Hard work and dedication got them to where they are, and uh, we appreciate what they have done uh, in that and uh, how far they've gone in life, and uh, most of the time, most of us know that is just the beginning of life, amen, and uh, now they enter the workforce and get out in the field, uh, and there's plenty of work to be done out there. So they, is he in here? Y'all ready? All right, come on up this morning. But we want to recognize our graduates. I know when they graduate, mom and dad want to give them cars and, and cell phones and all of these things, give them all the nice things in life. And I'm sure some of them probably gave them a Bible. But we want to give them something they can use in life uh, for the rest of their life. And we pray that they will take this and allow we to carry them through life, and uh, this will be the next road map that they'll use. Listen, their teachers have been telling them what to do all their life. Uh, their mom and dad's been telling them what to do all their life, and uh, these right here have been respectful to their moms and dads, and so I pray that they'll do the same thing with the Word of God, that they'll take the Word of God for the rest of their lives and allow the Word of God to guide them in life. And every event that they use in life will go every place they go in life. I pray that they will use that in life and let God carry them. So we want to present all of them with the Bible today. Miss Katie Gentry. Amen. I'll give her a big hand today. Miss Ariel Guy today. Thank the Lord for her. Amen. And then we've got Mr. Elliot Jones today. Give him a big hand. Amen. And then Mr. Ian Martin today, we appreciate, love you guys in the Lord, and uh, thank you for your hard work and dedication of trying to get through, amen, I know it's been tough, and I pray that you have future plans that are great plans to serve God in whatever you do, amen, I know you got to go into the workforce, it ain't going to be long, so I think somebody mentioned a while back about them, about them being, uh, some of these parents being empty nesters and stuff like that. And listen, there's going to be the joy of owning your own home, you know, working, paying your own bills, paying your own car insurance, you know, buying your own food, putting your own groceries, buying, paying your own light bill. So get used to it. It's going to be the joy of your life. I'm just telling you, amen. Uh, I've been doing it for 100 years. I know exactly what I'm talking about, amen. But I pray you enjoy life, but let God's word guide you in life, amen. We love them today and appreciate what the Lord's done. Oh, you're going to go back and change? Amen. But we appreciate them today, appreciate our graduates uh, today. I never had the opportunity to do that, amen? And, uh, pro and I tell them all the time, this just means I'm smarter than them, amen? It's what it is, and uh, I quit school. You know, I went through nine years of school and uh, never made uh, anything less than a C, and I don't ever remember making but one or two of them uh, while I was in school. I was a pretty good student. Uh, it, while I was in school, and I went through nine years of school, and then after the ninth grade, uh, I quit. I got out that summer. I had to go to work. Uh, my dad was in prison, and uh, I had somebody had to go to work, and I went to work. And uh, I don't regret any of it, to be honest with you. And uh, I went back. It's been 20 years ago now, and I just turned 60 years old, but I was somewhere around 40 years old, and I needed my diploma to be a volunteer fireman. How about that? And I went back and got a GED. Amen. And so what took them 12 years to get? I got in two nights. <laughs> I'm just saying. Some people are smart enough. I'm just picking. Amen. I'm just, I'm just picking. Amen. <laughs> but what a blessing to see them go through all those years. Uh, an accomplishment that they've had in life. What a, what a blessing that is. I thank God for it. I should have went to school a lot longer. I can tell you that. I'd probably got me a a job behind a desk somewhere, run a computer. I can't even run a computer now. And my back wouldn't have been hurting. My knees wouldn't have been hurting, amen. My neck hurting and everything else going on now. But praise the Lord for that. Turn your Bibles this morning. Book of Luke, chapter number 24. 
Luke chapter number 24. A few weeks ago, and some of our young people are going to remember this, a few weeks ago I took some of our young people to a revival meeting up in Burlington, and uh, there was a young man there preaching that night that preached out of Luke chapter number 24, uh, and no, I'm not going to preach his message, probably not even anything close to it, uh, but there was a young man preaching that night, and I'm going to tell you, he knocked a home run. And I thank God for it. And then our young people that went with us, they were excited about going back the next night. And I, I don't think they end up not going, but they were excited over what he had preached. And while this young man was preaching that night, and there's something that he read here uh, in the Word of God that he didn't come close to preaching on, uh, but it pricked my heart. And uh, if you're any kind of a, a Bible student at all, you'll know that there's time that you read the Word of God. Uh, and it's those little things that stick out to you that God just pricks your heart about and says, hey, I need you to take a look at that right there, if you would. With that particular night, as soon as he read uh, the scriptures, there's two words that stuck out here in the, in the book of uh, Luke. And here in Luke chapter 24, we're dealing with uh, the resurrection morning here. And we know the story here. If you go back and read from the beginning here in Luke chapter 24, how they had went to the tomb uh, early in the morning, they found that the stone was rolled away, and, and Mary and Joanna and, and the other Mary went in and found that Christ was gone, and all they saw were the clothes here. And they had gone about the village, began to tell all these people what was going on and what had taken uh, place. And there's some, just like we have today, they didn't believe uh, uh, what was happening, but they couldn't find the body of, of Christ. They do know that. And then there, there was two men here walking on the road to Emmaus here, and while they were walking, the Bible says they were talking amongst themselves and they were asking questions amongst themselves. Well, you find here, if you study this out, I believe those men were probably very perplexed in their life at that time. Something big had happened uh, in their life and they could not figure out why or what was uh, going on. They were very discouraged at this time, I will tell you that, uh, in what they were talking about. Jesus recognized that and Jesus came along beside these two men and began to ask them uh, what they were talking about. And, of course, they looked at Christ and said, Hey, you must be a stranger in the land. Don't you know what's uh, been going on here? There's some crazy things that's been uh, happening here, and that's why we're talking about what we're talking about. But I, I, I do believe these men were, were very perplexed in what uh, they were saying. They were in doubt at this time. They were discouraged uh, at this time. They're walking with their heads hung low uh, at this time. They're trying to get back. Uh, to where the rest of the people that were on that road to uh, Emmaus. And then Jesus comes along. And, and here in verse number 18 in Luke 24, the Bible says, And one of them, whose name was Cliff, was answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And here's what God pricked my heart at. And he said unto them, What things? What things? The Bible says, and they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. And we trusted, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day. Since these things were done, yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even, even uh, so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto, him, said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. God pricked my heart that very night about those two words right there, what things, amen. I went home that night and I jotted down some uh, notes and for the last three or four weeks I have worked on that and worked on it and looked in the word of God and looked at some things in my own life uh, to be honest with you. And I thought about this thought right here because I believe that we all have them. What are the what things in your life that has you so perplexed? What are the what things in your life 
that has you discouraged? What are the what things in your life that has you in doubt right now? What are the what things in your life that has you disturbed? I dare say every person sitting in this auditorium today no doubt has something. There's a what thing in their life that's causing them some problems today. There's no question about it. It may be a little thing. It may be a, a big thing. But whatever it is, I can tell you this. We're just like these two men right here. It is literally sucking the life out of us. Amen. And our heads are bowed and our heads are down. And we can't figure out how to uh, go on in life. And, and seemingly all of these things is happening. We just can't figure it out. And listen, for some people, we just can't move on and just can't go past that. I want to say to you, hey, as your pastor from the pulpit, this last year of my life, listen, there's been some what things in my life. And I'll be honest with you, some of them have been tough. There's been days I didn't want to go on. There's been days I didn't want to preach. There's been days I didn't want to read and study. There's been days I didn't want to witness. There's been days I didn't want to sing the song of Zion. Hey, there's been days I didn't want to go out and knock a door. There's been days I didn't want to visit in a hospital. Hey, there's been days I didn't want to speak to anybody at all. Why? Just because of the things going on in, in my life. Listen, it wasn't anything I was doing. It's what the things were in my life. And I dare say everybody sitting here today has some of those. If you're sitting here today and nothing at all is bothering you, you ought to shout right now. Amen. <laughs> you ought to, you ought, listen, if I was you, I'd run the aisle today. If I was sitting in here and ain't nothing in the world bothering me and I don't have any problems at all, you ought to run the aisle. Because you're one in a million right now. Amen. I don't know about you, there's things bothering everybody all the place, all over the place, all the time. And I begin to think about this, and I begin to search the Word of God, and I begin to look at those people in God's Word that had gone through things in life. And I could have used several people in the Word of God, there's no doubt, but I chose the life of Paul here to maybe help you and I out today about the what things in your life. Some of you sitting here right now going, I know what's bothering me this morning. I know why I'm so down this morning. I know what's, what's, what's made my, my, my whole week a mess this week, amen. I, I know there's some things there that I can take care of. Look with me to Acts chapter number 20, if you would. Acts chapter number 20, and we're going to read verse number 24. I love this verse right here. I found it months ago, uh, reading the Word of God. And listen, Paul here was going through some uh, terrible times here. And Paul, we know the story of Paul, and a lot of things had befelled Paul at this time. Matter of fact, uh, let's go back to verse number 17. We'll read through uh, verse number 24 real quick. And then I want to use Paul's life to maybe help you and I with the what things in our life. What is it that's causing me to be in doubt? What is it that's causing me to be distracted? You know what God wants to do more than, more than anything? I mean, the devil wants to do more than anything today. He wants to distract you. He wants to put enough in your life to distract you from God and the things of God. He wants, matter of fact, he will distract you right now while you're sitting in here this morning so that you don't hear the message today. Amen. But Paul says, the Bible says in Acts chapter number 20, verse 17, the Bible says, And from Miletus, Miletus he sent up to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And then they would come to him. He said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you all at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews and how I kept back nothing uh, that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the thing that shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But look what he said in verse 24. But none of these things move me. Paul said, I ain't discouraged by none of them. I ain't moved by any of them. Listen, we can have a broke toenail. And it'll move us to go crazy sometime. We're depressed about everything that's going on in life so many times. Paul says, but, I'm, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, 
so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I begin to look at Paul's life and many other men in the Word of God here and, and look at my life and I begin to look at some what things that are in my life that disturbed me. Listen, I found out in Paul's life here, there were some things that could not disturb him. There were some things that could not uh, disappoint him. There were some things that, that could not discourage him. There were some things that he was not in doubt about in his life. And listen, I believe Paul's situation is just like ours so many times. So I began to look at some what things in my life and in Paul's life and that are probably in your life. And I'm going to go ahead and hit the main one to begin with just in case you don't want to hear the, hear the rest of them. Let me tell you what the, the main what thing in your life is causing you probably more problem than anything else. People. People. Most of us today are more, more discouraged and more disturbed and more disappointed and more in doubt because of people more than we are anything else. It is people that discourage us. It is people that put us in doubt. I'm very disturbed by people a lot of times. Amen? But Paul said, yeah, I believe one of the problems Paul had in his life that he went through it and caused him to get to where he was in his life was one of those what things in his life was people. And sometimes it's people of the past, sometimes it's the people of now, and sometimes it's the people of tomorrow. But I'm glad that Paul says, hey, I put all those things behind me, amen. Can I say to you today, those people that give you problems about your past, look with me to Philippians chapter 13, if you would, real quick. I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Look over here with me real quick, let's read this. Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 13. The Bible says this right here. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forth of the things which are before me, I press toward the mark of the, high, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, the people in Paul's past did not disturb him. They did not discourage him. They did not put him in doubt because Paul chose to leave them behind to walk away from them and follow God and move forward in the glory of God and say, hey, I am not about to let you be a one thing in my life and tell me what I can and cannot do. There's some of you sitting in here today. You're still dwelling on yesterday. You're still dwelling on 10 years ago. The people in your life that, that, that you think are going to make fun of you and laugh at you and, and mock at you and talk about you listen you better get over that junk amen because people are going to be your greatest problem in your life the more i pastor the more i find out i have more problems out of people than i do anything at all amen but we better understand something paul said none of that moves me people that paul said people are not going to move me they can talk about my past if they want to they ain't going to move me they can talk about what i'm doing now they ain't going to move me they can talk about headed if they want to they're not going to move me why they're just a what thing in my life but they're not going to move me in what i do for christ i'm going forward for god listen get over it and put those things behind us there's too many christians sitting around today and i, I meet them all the time well you know brother mike you know these people are talking really don't let people move you to do something y'all not do don't let them be a what thing in your life and keep you perplexed all the time? Keep you in doubt all the time? Keep you disappointed all the time? The Bible, Paul said these words right here in Romans chapter number 8, verse 28. He said, that, matter of fact, let me read that to you real quick so, you don't, so, so I don't misquote it. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 28. We just read that recently here in the Word of God. The Bible says, we know that all things work together good to them to love God, to them who are the call, who are called, uh, the call according to his purpose. Paul said, hey, I'm not going to be disappointed because I know that some things happen in my life because of God. But God's going to work them out to the good in my life. Can I, listen, you, you young people who just graduated, you better mark it down. There's going to be some people try to discourage you. 
They'll, they'll mock at you because you did make it, amen? And they'll try to discourage you in life so that you'll take the wrong road in life. Don't let them become a what thing in your life. When you're walking along, you're perplexed, and you think, well, there's that thing over there in my past that's causing me not to uh, move forward. I'm disturbed by it. I'm, I'm disappointed by it. I'm discouraged by it. Listen, one thing I found out about Paul is he got over pleasing people, and he decided he was going to please God in life. Amen? That's why we gave him those Bibles this morning. Listen, take those Bibles and learn to please God and quit trying to please your neighbor. Quit trying to please that person sitting on the pew uh, beside you. Quit trying to please your family. Amen? Quit trying to please everybody else. In life, listen, learn to please God. Hey, Proverbs chapter number 16, verse 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Think about that. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Leave them alone. People, I believe, are some of the greatest sweat things in our life. And seemingly we can't get over them. And seemingly we can't get past them. I believe one of the other things is, and it comes from people, is persecution. Paul said, I'm not moved by persecution. I ain't moved by people. And look up here at me. Paul put it this way, I ain't moved by what you don't like. If I've heard it one time, I've heard it a thousand times. Well, Brother Mike, if you did, I don't, I ain't moved by what you don't like. Especially if you're out of the will of God and you got the wrong attitude. I've told y'all this story before. A man walked out. As a matter of fact, he did this on several occasions. A man walked out, church building one day, one night during revival. He had a visiting preacher here, and here's the words he told me. He said, I'm sure glad we got a visiting preacher in there. We finally heard some good preaching. I said, I appreciate that. Amen. Thank you for that. I ignored him. Amen. I could have took that and went and sat in my office and cried and thought, there's somebody better than me. You know the deal is? I know there's somebody better than me. Amen. I don't question that. There's a lot more preachers, more educated than I am. There's a lot more preachers that can articulate a whole lot better than I can. There's a lot more preachers that's got degrees all over the wall. Amen. Some of them are probably say you some of them right now. Listen, they have it all. Amen. But listen, that does not cause us to be disturbed. Amen. God, why? Because God called us to do a work uh, regardless. But Paul says, hey, put those things behind you here. Persecution should not move us. Can I tell you today, listen, if we're going to glory in God, the Bible is very clear. It says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We have the weakest crowd in our church today we've ever had. All over the world today. My wife and another lady was out visiting just a while back. And uh, somebody made a negative comment about me and said, yeah, they see, I know that preacher down there. <laughs> they said, you know him? I said, yeah, I know him. They said, he said this and he said that and he said this and the other lady that was with her said, no, he didn't. That's my pastor, and he didn't say that. He might have told you the truth, and you didn't like it, but he didn't say that. Too many times we worry about persecution. Well, I, I like this. There, there, there's, a, there's a man and his wife that go to this church right now. They go to this church right now. And let me tell you why he's here, and I didn't know this. He'd been here for months, and I didn't know this. But he told me one day, he said, Preacher, did I ever tell you what got me to your church? I said, no, sir, you never did. He said, well, you know, we was out of church and couldn't have church because of the pandemic. And he said, I told my wife one morning, one Sunday morning, he said, look, go online and see if anybody's having church. I'm, I'm sick and tired of sitting in the house. I, I want to go to church. And so she went online and she found one of our Facebooks on there. And he said, there was some woman on there wearing you out. I mean, she was giving you down in the country. And he said, my wife told me, she said, but there's some lady on here giving him down the country. He said, that's where I want to go. <laughs> if he's being persecuted for having his church doors open and standing on the truth, that's where I want to go. Guess what? They've been here ever since. Amen. Persecution ain't such a bad thing after all. 
I just wish I knew who she was so I could go and tell her thank you. Amen. Amen. I appreciate you going on Facebook and running me down and talking junk about me. Amen. I appreciate all of that. Why? Because somebody got in the glory of God because of it. But this day and time, we get a little persecution out there and it becomes a what thing in my life. Brother Mike, you don't know, you don't know how bad it hurts. Listen, I know how bad it hurts. But we're overcomers. We're overcomers. Can I tell you why Paul was persecuted? For obedience. Paul was persecuted for obedience. He got persecuted over and over again because he was obedient in the things of God. And he decided this, that I'm going to obey God fully if I have to eat all the persecution in the world. I'm going to obey God rather than men. Listen, you need to be careful. You need to be careful how you persecute those that are serving God. Amen. We need to be careful about that. We better leave that junk alone. I was watching just the other night. Jane called me to the side the other night. And she said, I want to show you something. She was looking at, a, looking at the uh, computer there and saw a little Facebook post. And there was a man on there with another pastor friend of mine that I know very well. And she said, I want you to come on and show you something. A blast from the past. So I went down there and she showed it to me. And uh, it was a pastor that I asked years ago, many years ago. I called him and said, hey, I want you to come preach a couple night revival meet for me. And he said, can't do it, preacher. I was kind of stunned, to be honest with you. He just can't do it. He said, I know your past. I wanted to just take a long conversation and tell him all about that, but I didn't. But here's what he said. He said, if I, got, if I come preach to you, he said, I got all these brethren that let, never let me preach in their church again. I said, I'm glad you told me that. Didn't need you anyway. Sorry I called. Appreciate it. Amen. Now, I could have took that, and I could have crawled up in a corner somewhere and cried my eyeballs out. But I found out about a year after that, the same man, this same preacher, this same preacher got ran out of his church, got caught doing some things that he shouldn't have been doing, got ran out of his church. Amen. But he wanted to persecute somebody who had a bad past. I did have a bad past. It wasn't good, but I'm glad it's all washed. <laughs> Paul said Sick, such were some of you. Amen. He said, but you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified. You've been glorified. Amen. By the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Listen, we have to get over persecution sometimes. It becomes a terrible what thing in our life that seemingly we can't get past. I'm scared people are going to say this, and I'm afraid people are going to say that, and I'm afraid people are going to Listen, stop all that junk. All that persecution becomes a what thing in your life? It disappoints you and it discourages you and it puts you in doubt and it disturbs you over and over again. Listen, the reason for Paul's persecution was because he was obedient. But let's look at the results of Paul's persecution. The Bible says it made him strong. Look at me, Romans chapter number 1. Chapter number 1, verse number 16. Let's look at the results of Paul's persecution. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. <laughs> For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, and it is written, The just shall live by faith. Listen. The Bible is clear here that Paul's persecution did nothing but make him stronger in his stand for God. If the persecution of the brethren and the persecution of the world is making you weak, it ain't their problem, it's yours. Amen? It ought to make you stronger. You talk about me and tell me something I can't do and I'm headstrong, you got a problem on your hand. Because I'm going to do it or bust wide open one or the other. Amen. Listen, every time somebody persecutes us in Christ, they ought to make us that much stronger for God. 
We ought to shout that much louder for God. We ought to go that much more for God. We ought to give that much more for God. Why? Just because they said something about it. Well, I don't like what you're doing. I don't care what you don't like. We're going to do it twice as much now. Just because, hey, if it's of God, go do it twice as much. Just so they have something else to talk about. But that persecution becomes a what thing in our life. But listen, Paul did it by obedience. The results of it was Paul became strong. What was the reward of it? Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's look over here for just a minute. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Verse, verse 7. Paul says, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appear. And then he said, hey, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Listen, Paul, Paul had a great reward there because he chose to suffer the persecution and get stronger for God. People will become one of those what things in our life. Persecution will become one of those what things in our life. We don't want anybody saying anything negative about us or uh, bad about us, but I can tell you, with, tell you this, they persecuted Christ, didn't they? Amen. They persecuted Moses, didn't they? I mean, they persecuted Paul, didn't they? They persecuted Jeremiah, didn't they? They persecuted Ezekiel, didn't they? Amen. Amen. Listen, listen, everybody I find in the Word of God that did anything off of God, I found out that they faced persecution. I could have went through anywhere and pulled out names from all over the place because everyone that I saw that did anything at all for God became persecuted. You said, Brother Mike, I've never been persecuted, probably because you've never done anything for God. We've always wanted to please everybody. <laughs> I just want to make them happy. I want everybody to just love me. I don't want any enemy. Let me just tell you something. You've got some enemies whether you want them or not. And that person you're trying to please, you think is your friend, they're really not your friend. Because that last friend you they was around there is talking about you. Amen. We have to learn to take some things in life. People, people will become one of those what things in our life. Persecution will become one of those what things in our life. But I'll tell you, there's a reward for that. It's a crown of righteousness down the road. I mean, there'll be a, there's going to be a day, one day, listen, when God's going to crown His children. Those that stand for Him, those that choose to fight the battle for Him. If there's ever been a year that I've wanted to quit the ministry, I promise you it's been this year. I promise you it has. Brother Mike, what have you got in your life so bad? Listen, I, I ain't got time to stand here and tell you, and I wouldn't tell you. But if there's been a time that I just want to quit and go on just because of persecution in my life this year, I'd have quit a long time ago. We have to learn that thing. Don't let that thing become a what thing. Listen, listen Jesus said, what, hey, what thing are you talking about? I can tell you they pointed back to the people. I, take, I can tell you these men pointed back to the persecution where Christ had been persecuted and all of those that followed Christ were persecuted. Listen, they begin to point back to those same things. And listen, then we get over here to Paul's life. Paul said, hey, I want you to understand something. That ain't going to move me. I care less about your persecution is what he was saying. I'm not moved by that. I'm not moved by those who want to talk about you all the time and run you down all the time. You serve God and love God and do what God's called you to do. Let that crowd go. Pray for them. Pray for them, amen. Hey, listen, the Bible says to pray for our enemies. Let God heap heat, uh, uh, heaps of coal on them, amen. But too many times we're worried about what they're going to say. But listen, there's a reason for persecution, and that is obedience. And trust me, if you're not obedient to Christ, chances are you'll never get persecuted for anything. Not for Christ anyway. I mean, if you go along, get along, you follow the crowd, do whatever they, they say do, and you bow down, uh, uh, to them, listen, you, 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 everything, <laughs> you, listen, you don't have to worry being a part of the council culture. Just bow down to everything they say do. If they say take a shot, take a shot. If they say drink a beer, drink a beer. If they say everything's going to be fine, believe them. Amen? You will never have a problem in life. But you stand up once against, once against one of them demons and find out. Amen? 
Nowadays, they'll cut you off. I, I mean, they'll persecute you. They'll cut you off. They'll cancel your culture like you don't even exist anymore. Amen? That's what they're good at. That's why they're demonized. Amen? But listen, we better learn those what things in our life, that persecution. Listen, we got to stop it from moving us to do, from doing what we're supposed to do. Not only that, but I thought about this. With Paul, problems couldn't move him. Problems couldn't move him. Anybody got problems today? I mean, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody got problems? I, I know I'm talking to the right crowd. I mean, problems couldn't move him. I've never seen to beat my life all the little problems going on in life that moves people away from God with their heads hung. They simply can't, can't get past it, simply can't get over it, and simply can't go on because there's a little problem here and the, there's a little problem there. And listen, Paul said these words right here. He said, hey, suffering is not going to move me. Separation is not going to move me. Sorrow is not going to move me. Listen, sometimes it takes a mountain in our life. Sometimes it takes a problem in our life. I don't know about y'all, but I've always tried to learn through my problems. I, I, I didn't want to go through a problem and not understand it when I got to the other side of it. I mean, God, if you're going to take me through it, I want, I, want, I want to just go ahead and indulge in it and so I can learn to be a better person on the other side of it, to be a stronger person on the other side. Too many times we got Christians running from the problems all the time. They can't handle the things of the world. They can't handle the things in life. They can't, listen, problems are going to come. You can get over it. When a, Brother Gene mentioned this morning about a, a family, uh, uh, some uh, young kids that got uh, killed this past week, uh, coming home from vacation or something about four of them killed. And Brother Gene said, I, I don't understand it. Listen, it rains on the just and unjust life. God has no respect of persons. It's the nature of life. Problems are going to come. We don't understand why. Dear friend of ours, we know right now, have a 22-year-old daughter that's battling cancer. Some of the greatest Christian, one of the greatest Christian families I know. We got a 22-year-old daughter just found out less than two weeks ago. How are they going to handle that? They're going to quit on God? Just going to stop because that becomes a what thing in their life? No, they ain't quit yet. He texted me yesterday morning and said, she's home. Her first the chemo went great. She's at the house. I've not heard him discouraged yet. I, I know they're going through some emotional things, but I've not heard one discouraging word out of him yet. He's strong in his faith. He's strong in the Lord. He loves God, and he knows the problem is going to come. Can I tell you this? Suffering is going to come in your life. Suffering is going to come in your life. Listen, the Bible says we're going to, the, 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 before the end time, we're going to have to suffer for Christ anyway. Right. Amen? We're going to have to suffer through some things. We, listen, we, we don't know what suffering is anymore. Uh, America uh, has no idea what uh, suffering is. Man, we look back at, at the old times and think about the old, the old ways and what they did, this, that, and the other. And I, and I look at it and think, it's, man, it's good times. I grew up that way. But listen, most of us, could, we couldn't handle the old days. Not this new generation. Man, we pampered them so much now they couldn't, they can't stand an ounce of suffering. The, the moment they have a headache, they run to the pill doctor. Well, I just, oh, I know. You broke your fingernail. They got a pill for that, right? That woman right there got a pill for everything. You don't believe it, ask her. We'd be riding sometime. Have a whole busload of people. And somebody said, I got this. She said, I got a pill for it. <laughs> Jane, I'll be riding around sometime. Somebody, she said, Terry Lynn's got a pill for it. <laughs> There's a pill for everything today. I mean, she has them. There's no doubt about it. But listen, listen, we, we're going to have to learn to suffer in life a little bit. And not let it move us to the point where we walk away from God and walk away from the church and walk away from the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, we cannot allow that to become a what thing in our life and move us away from God. And I see people all the time that go through suffering, problem. They, they go through separation. And guess what? They leave God. Paul says these words right here. Paul says, I am therewith to be content. Amen. I, I've learned in whatsoever state that I am in. To be content in Christ. My goodness, what would it be like if we ever got to the point that we were completely content in Christ? 
and nothing else. I think about it in my own life. Man, what would it be like if I didn't let any problems at all bother me? I don't know about y'all, but problems become some what things in my life sometimes. Amen. And can I tell you this? Most of them I can't do anything about it anyway. I can't change them. I can't fix them. I can't make people do anything at all. If I could, I think the world would be a better place. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know y'all don't know that. We can't figure that out. But I just think it would be a better place if I could go and say, I'm going to fix this today. I'm going to fix it. Amen. At least it would be a better place in my world if I fix some of them. Amen. Just cure them up. Amen. Get them, get them to think my way. Can you imagine that? I mean, Brother Mike, I don't want to think like you. Listen, it's probably good that you don't think like me. And it'd be two of us in the world. That'd be tough. But problem's going to come. Suffering's going to come. Separation is going to come. Sorrows are going to come. Paul said this right here. Bob says he had in his body marks from the whippings of where they whipped him. Galatians chapter number uh, 6, verse number 17. Let's, let's go there real quick. Galatians 6 and, and 17. Let me read that to you real quick this morning. Galatians chapter number 6 and, uh, and verse number 17. The Bible says this. says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, Because I bear his marks in my body, your whippings ain't going to bother me. Amen? Well, well, listen, whether it's a, uh, 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 just a, a persecution whipping, Amen. Uh, whether it's a physical, listen, Paul was physically whipped, by the way, also. Amen. But he said, just so you understand, they ain't going to move me. I, 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 got, I got other scars that had not moved me, he said. And he said, these, these ain't going to move me either. Amen. I, I'm going to stand with God. I'm going to stand where I'm supposed to stand. Why? Because Paul, Paul was one that said, I cannot allow problems to become that what thing in my life that discourages me, that disturbs me that disappoints me in life. I can't allow that to come into my life and get me down to the point that I can't do anything at all. People are a what thing. Persecution is a what thing. Problems are a what thing. Let me give you this. Powers. Powers. There's a lot of people afraid of powers. Now, let me give you a couple of powers here that I thought about that you ought to be careful with. And listen, if you're not going to be strong in the Lord, I would, be, I would be afraid too and be running. But Paul wasn't afraid of satanic power. It didn't change him according to the Word of God. Matter of fact, look with me back real quick if you're still in the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter number 13. Go to Acts 13 real quick. Let's read verses 9 through 12, Acts 13. Listen to what he says. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. And said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. You ever had anybody you want to say that to? <laughs> You ever, you ever want to look at anybody and just say, you child of the devil? You ain't nothing but a child of the devil. That's pretty bold, isn't it? But listen, that satanic power didn't bother Paul. And I want to tell you that satanic power will come against you from time to time. And the average Christian today is going to fold and go put his head under the pillow and cry all night long. Instead of looking at that person that's full of the devil, and say, hey, you devil. You ain't nothing but full of the devil. You think I'm going to listen to you one minute? You're crazy. You ought to get your heart right with God. Your mind's messed up. You ain't nothing but full of subtlety, and the devil here. That's what he says. And said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy, listen to this, thou enemy of all unrighteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, 
And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Paphlidia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Paul said, hey, you need to stop all that mess you're doing. There's times that I believe that it's okay for us to look at people and say, hey, that's of the devil and you need to stop it. Now, in today's world, you know what you are if you do that? You're a judge. You just think you're better than everybody. And we don't judge people anymore because we don't have judgment in America anymore. There's no judgment in America. I mean, uh, our, our administration is against that. That ain't judgment. That's just truth. Let me say this again. Truth is not judgmental. It's truth. Brother Mike, I don't like that brown suit you're wearing today. That's judgmental. Amen. Ain't, ain't, who, who cares what he wears? But that's judgmental if I don't like what he wears, what he wore today. Amen. But truth is not judgmental. Suppose I go to him and say, Brother Mike, got a brown suit on today. He said, Man, I sure do. <laughs> he told the truth. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but what if I come over here and say, Brother Mike, you're in sin. And I started naming off his sin, this, that, and other, because I know all, and he knows it's true. He's going to forget about that brown suit. Yeah, right. Amen. Well, listen, there's satanic power that wants to overcome us all the time. Satanic power is messing with our pastors and it's messing with our churches and it's messing with our young people and it's discouraging our young people. And mom and dad, look up here at me. I know most mom and daddies don't like this and I don't care. You will get over it. Or else you're going to pay the price one day. And I'm going to say this probably until God calls me home or God shows me different. As a mom and daddy, we put that in their hand day in and day out. And we allow them alone with it by theirself and think that they're really good kids and it's all okay. Don't be fooled. Satan's not blind. We give them more satanic power than any other generation has ever given their kids. We put it in their hands. Satan's power. How do you know that, Brother Mike? I got one on my side. Amen. I'm a grown up, I'm a pastor student of the word of God and all the time Satan's still trying to trying to get in do you think your child is clicking off of that all the time and going oh, I, <laughs> you're very fooled Paul says listen I'm not going to be moved by satanic power he said I'm going to overcome satanic power and I will tell you this as a church and the people that if you're going to stand for God and you're going to do the things of God, Satan is coming against you. He don't like you proclaiming the name of Christ. He don't like you telling others about Christ. He's going to come in your home. He's going to come in your marriage. He's going to mess with your mind. He's going to mess with your children. He's going to try to, try to mess with your pastor. He's going to try to mess with your fellowship. In the church, listen, he's going to come after you in every way, shape, form, or fashion. Well, I don't ever have this. Satan ain't never bothered me. There again, that's because you ain't never done anything in the name of God. Mark it down. Why would he bother you any, for any other reason? God's the only one that he hates. Christians are the only one that he hates. Amen? The rest of the world he owns anyway. But Paul said, that's not going to move me. I'm not going to be moved by Satan's power. I can tell you this. Paul says, I'm not going to be moved by sin's power. Now, I could park right here for a while. Look with me at Acts chapter number 14. Acts chapter number 14. Since I'm right here at it, I might as well just go ahead and finish it this morning. I know y'all ready to go. 
I mean, Satan have moved in and said, <laughs> about 10 of y'all done went, Satan going, have y'all looked at your watch lately? Do you know what time it is? I know what time it is, by the way. <laughs> Amen. Acts chapter number 14, verse 19. How be it as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came to the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas and Derby. And when they had preached the gospel of that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. This is right after Paul had been stoned and left for dead. There had been a sinful act that had taken place here, and Paul doing the work of the Lord, and that crowd didn't like it. And they took him out in the street, and they stoned him, and they left him for dead. When they walked away, Paul was laying on the ground as if he was dead. I can only imagine. When they walked away, Paul sat up and said, Ha, 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 watch this. I'm going right back, start preaching again. Listen, they took Peter and John out, whipped them and said, Hey, don't you dare mention Jesus' name again. The Bible says as soon as they got on the street, they started shouting Jesus again. They started talking about the Lord again. Listen, I don't know Matt, how many of us just in time, if they were to take me out down and stone me and whip me, I can tell you this, they better kill me. Because I know what's going to happen when I get done. I'm going to ask God, listen, I'm going to ask God for forgiveness before I ever go. But I'm going to the house, I'm going to get my gun, and I'm going to find somebody. Amen? That shows you I ain't all there. But I'd like to think I'd like to get up and go, oh, watch this. They drug me out, beat me yesterday. If y'all will show up in the morning, we're going to preach again. Amen? Listen, sin will try its best to destroy us. Not only in that fashion. But sin creeps in just a little bit at a time. Sin becomes one of the greatest what thing in our life. It, be, it starts to destroy us and deteriorate us and eat at us. One little thing. And sometimes I sit back because you can't do anything at all. You have to sit back and watch it play out. Sometimes you've got to sit back and you watch every little move. And I think, that's fixing to be a disaster. I'm watching. I'm watch, y'all, I want y'all to look up here at me. I'm watching right now a couple of families in our church. And I'm just preaching New Life Baptist Church. I'm watching right now. There ain't a thing in the world I can do but pray. But sin is deteriorating them right now. I can't do anything about it. You don't know why? They won't listen to me. I'm just a pastor. They won't listen. And you sit back and you watch sin tear them down. And I say, hey, don't you understand that sin? I don't want to hear that. Okay. Don't you understand? I'll take care of this and handle my own problem. Okay. But Paul said these words, that sin ain't going to stop me. And it ain't going to move me. Why? Because I'm set on serving God first. Your mind is not set first. Fully on serving God fully and set to the uttermost of God. Let me tell you what you're going to do. We're going to fall for every little sin that comes along. And then one day it's going to be, well, I'll just miss a Wednesday night. You know, they won't miss me. I'll, well, I really don't enjoy Sunday night anyway because I've been there already on Sunday. Here's the devil. I don't already been there on Sunday now. I mean, do we really? It's little things at a time. And then before you know it, you know, we're sitting around watching a little TV, we watch a cell phone, we do a little thing. Before you know it, we're off doing thing, uh, things in the world. And you watch it play out. I've watched it play out so many times, listen, it, I can write the book on it. I've watched it play out. And over and over again, I've said, please, please don't let that sin destroy you. It becomes a what thing in your life. I don't know what it is, but it becomes a what thing in your life. Let me give you this last one. Here's why Paul wouldn't move. 
And I said all, everything I've said today to get to this point right here. Here's why Paul wouldn't move. Because of his salvation power. He wouldn't move by satanic power. He wouldn't move by sinful power. Because of his salvation power. And Paul had power to know that God had saved him. He had power to know that God had secured him. He had power to know that God had separated him. He had power to know that God had sealed him in his life. Paul had salvation power, and he knew it. He knew that God had touched his heart. He knew that God had changed his heart. He knew that God had changed his mind. And Paul became a force for Christ and would not allow the what thing to destroy his relationship with a holy God. Paul just said, no, I ain't doing that. I'm going to stay strong in the Lord. I don't care what people say. I don't care how much you persecute me. I don't care what problems come. Listen, I don't care what powers come. I'm going to serve God through it all. What would a church be like today? What would a people be like today if we had the audacity that Paul had? And said, of what things are not going to stop me? Listen, I could talk about what things for the rest of this day. I could go on a list and a rampage today that would blow your mind on the little thing this year that's got in my way that I don't like and try to discourage me. But over and over and over again, I had to remind myself I'm a born-again Christian. God, you called me to preach the gospel. And God, if I stop because of that, I'm going to stop because of this. God, if I lay down because of that, I'm going to lay down because of this. God, if I quit because of this, I'm going to quit because I'm going to quit because of that. Listen, don't let the what things in your life destroy your relationship with God. Some of you sitting here today, you know that it's people that's causing you problems. You got somebody out there causing you problems, giving you all kind of trouble. I mean, just, just trying to stir you up and tear you down. Look at them. Most of us won't do that. We'll text them. Just look up here at me. If I ever got anything important to tell you in that fashion, I ain't going to text it to you. I'm going to come talk to you. Now, I may text you something I want to say, but, but if I got anything that, that important to tell you and I need to call you a devil, I ain't going to call you a devil over text. I'm going to call you a devil to your face if you get to that point. I'm going to look you straight in the eye so you'll know where I'm coming from. Amen? Don't let people get you in that fix. Don't let persecution get you in that fix. Hey, forget about what you did. Don't let problems move you to that point in your life. And don't let the powers of Satan and the powers of sin Get you to a point you can't serve God. The person that's not serving God today, that's walked away from God, you know what's wrong? Sin has taken over their life. They can say what they want, but sin has taken over their life. The power of Satan has overcome their mind, and they think that they're okay living in what they're living in. And they think this, that God's okay with it. That God's okay with it. Blake, come get on the piano for me. What are the what things in your life? Is that me? That's probably the Holy Ghost talking to some of you. Amen. What are the what things in your life? What's stopping you from fully surrendering and serving God. I'm talking about, I ain't talking about warming the church. But listen, I know people get mad at me. People get mad at me. They get upset with me, you know, about just warming people. But listen, people do that. Amen? I'm talking about being truly born again. I told this in the Sunday school class this morning. Dr. Phil Kidd was preaching the other night. And, and uh, at the tent meeting there in Greenville, Great message, one of the greatest messages I've ever heard. And during that meeting the other night, he was preaching on this thought, when you can't get through. When you can't get through. 
And I sat and listened to the whole message. I'm telling you, it was awesome. I needed it. He said there was a man, I remember when he preached this meeting, he preached a 10-week meeting, camp meeting, years ago, and I remember him preaching the meeting. I remember watching some of it and talked to him about it. And he said there was a man that came to that meeting, him and his wife came to that meeting for 10 weeks every night, every night for 10 weeks, every night for 10 weeks. They came to that meeting. The kid said the last night of the meeting, and y'all know how he is, he builds things up anyway. He said last night at that meeting, they're sitting in the middle of that meeting, he said about middle way through his preaching, he said that man jumped up, screamed, hollered like you ain't never heard, threw his Bible straight up in the air, papers flying everywhere, and he thought, oh my God, the devil has done God in here. That's probably what I think that happened this morning. Amen. The devil's done God in here. And so the preacher went over there to the man and got the man, called him down to the altar, and he said he heard the man weeping and crying and just bawling out over there. And he said he finished preaching, and after he got done preaching, he went over there to where the preacher was, and he said the preacher was kneeled down to the man that was still crying, and said, he said, ask him, he said, what happened? What happened? He said, preacher, I want to tell you a story. You want to listen to this. He said, 23 years ago, my wife and I went to a revival meeting on a Sunday night. We'd been invited to a revival meeting. My wife and I went. And he said, while I was there that night, God convicted my wife and I both to get saved that night. He said, we were sitting on the back row and the preaching, and, the, and it stirred me up. And God tugged at my heart to go to an altar and I wouldn't go. He said, my wife looked at me and said, James, you can go to hell if you want to, but I'm going to get Jesus. And she went down and got saved. He said, but for 23 years now, we have served God. We have Going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night for 23 years. We've been faithful in God's house for 23 years. He said, but I want to tell you this. God has never dealt with me again. He said, I, reject, I rejected Christ that night. And he has never dealt with me again for 23 years. He said, I have begged God. I have begged God and, and wept God. And beg God to deal with me. And God wouldn't do it. For 23 years, I've been in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. With nothing. God wouldn't deal with me. Because I rejected him that night. But he said tonight, when you were preaching, you said something. He said the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me. He said, you either get saved tonight or you'll never get the opportunity again. And he said, preacher, I missed it the first time. I wouldn't have about to miss it this time. Amen. Listen, the devil will tell you a lie. And he'll tell you everything's okay. But I, I, I listen, I, I'm not surprised by the number of people that sit in churches week after week after week after hearing the gospel that reject Christ. They laugh him off. And they mock at it. And God never has to deal with them again. But he said, God dealt with me, and I couldn't contain it. If God's ever dealt with you, you know it. And you won't allow those what things become things in your life that stop you from serving God. Amen? We need the Lord today. We need some people strong in the Lord today. We need some people willing to stand in the Lord. We, listen, we need to know that the army is there with us in everything that we do. What are you going to do for God? Or what is that what thing in your life that's going to stop you from doing it for God? Let's all stand our feet today. Every head bowed, every eye closed.